books are magic for having me again. Um, my first book was also launched at Books Are Magic back when we could all gather in the beautiful space. So one day soon, um, let's hope. And thank you, Pachaya, for taking the time to do this. I, Bangkok, um, Bangkok Wakes Terrain is absolutely beautiful. So everyone should get it. Um, I'm just going to read two short passages from Edge Case. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. Outside on the streets of the Flatiron District, ash was falling from the sky like celestial dandruff. The breaking news report had mentioned an enormous plume of smoke that developed in the explosion's aftermath. My instincts told me to steer clear, but I still felt a strange desire to see the plume with my own eyes, mainly so I could tell my husband, Marlin, about my brush with death. Things hadn't been great between us. I was hoping the threat of physical danger could get him talking to me again. America is getting more and more unsafe. We might say to each other, shaking our heads, his palms sketching calming circles on my back. We take turns bringing up other recent incidents in Flatiron, like the suspicious package outside a hardware store that turned out to be a decade old hulk of a printer abandoned on the sidewalk, or the real actual bomb found in a dumpster outside a facility that serves the blind. We sigh over the calculating cruelty of banking on blind people being less likely to discover the bomb. It chilled our hearts. America, we would say, looking at each other, our mouths downturned. This kind of talk soothed us, made us feel slightly superior to our fates. We were both on H-1B work visas, and we were running out of time. Unless our employers could be persuaded to sponsor green cards, we would soon have to leave the country for Malaysia or become undocumented when our paperwork expired. But if America was so rife with danger, then leaving was no hardship, right? Exiting would be the safe thing, the smart thing, wouldn't it? I decided not to go toward the flashing lights and police tape. Instead, I walked into a Duane Reed far from its namesake streets, wondering if it too felt helpless, so removed from home, and yet bearing such obvious marks of it. I paid for a box of surgical masks advertised as 99% effective. And then one more scene from later on the book. Another sunny summer morning in Manhattan, winter decorative cabbages giving way to more vibrant leafy plants on sidewalks protected by ankle high tree guards made of rusty steel. This was the city I lived in littered with dog shit to step around and vest wearing people holding clipboards to avoid. You know how it is. Though for too long after I moved here, I'd stream a movie, a romantic comedy perhaps, or something like a wry take on urban millennial living, and it'd be set in New York, and I'd watch, wistful, wishing I were there. Then with a start, I'd recognize a street corner or a flash of the skyline and realize I did live in that same space depicted on screen, except my life had nothing to do with that silver city. It was like getting glimpses of a parallel dimension. Since I was up too early, I decided to walk to work. I dropped my letter to Marlin in a sidewalk mailbox not far from the office and went into a tiny cafe nearby. No seating space and no one in line. A handwritten sign on the counter read, we're cashless. What kind of non-dairy milk do you have? I asked. The barista wore a slouchy beanie paired with an apron that wasn't tied at his waist. The apron billowed and sagged as he leaned down to perch his elbows on the counter, looked me up and down, and said, Cambodian breast milk. The door jingled on my wordless way out. If Marlene were still living with me, I would have said something. I would have said something because then when I recounted the episode to him, I would have come off cool. It had been a ritual almost, one that I relished. We would trade reports of microaggressions, laughing at the more ridiculous of them, even though they also hurt a little, of course. It's us against the world, I would tell him. I've got your back, he'd say, pinching at the fat below the hooks of my bra. That's it. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you for reading um, those Thanks patches. So, um, so let me start at the very beginning. How did this novel come to you? <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's really hard 
to answer because there are so many, um, I think, paths into the novel and so many drafts, but I would say one uh, part, um, I, I'll just try to explain it through a couple of anecdotes. One is, um, so I moved to New York um, in my 20s, um, and I, I moved to the US at 19. Um, and, you know, of course, the the broad reaches of US media, you know, it's it's global. Um, I did like the US movies like Jurassic Park and what whatnot um, did make their way and I watched them, whatever was not censored. Um, but there's still lots of stuff you you don't know about America, especially um, as an, you know, as a person not depicted in, on screen in these Hollywood movies, right? There's, there are no Asian American people in Jurassic Park, I don't think. Anyway, so um, I moved to New York and then, um, so one night, uh, not too long after I moved to New York, I was standing um, on a somewhat dark street corner in Manhattan and I was trying to get a cab. Um, and I, I lived in Manhattan at that point. I was trying to get a cab home and I put my hand out um, and the cab slowed the driver sort of looked out the windows, like had, took a good look at me and then said, oh, I'm not going to Queens and then sped off. Um, and then I was surprised at first, but then later um, I really got to thinking, you know, there's so many contexts and information that I had needed to absorb and internalize to like understand this encounter, right? Like, first of all, that um, cab drivers shouldn't, but they do discriminate <laughs> um, based on like picking up passengers based on what you look like to like the Asian um, American connection to Queens um, and then three sort of like my place my new place um, in New York in America um, and it it was a little startling to um, realize that I instantly understood everything about this encounter uh, but I hadn't realized I had taken, taken on all of these things about how people perceive me in America. Like I'd slowly accumulated all this, you know, uh, you, I'm tempted to say useless knowledge, but it's probably actually useful knowledge to know how you're stereotyped, um, like what, what kinds of discriminations you might expect to face. Um, so I was thinking about um, that a lot. And also uh, I, um, as a as an immigrant worker in America, I was dependent um, on getting a work visa. Um, and at some point, at one point, one of my attempts um, did not succeed. So you, there's a cap for how many work visas are handed out each year. Um, and the first sort of hurdle for this application process is literally a lottery. So, you know, you throw your hat into a ring, so to speak, and then a computer sort of decides your fate. Um, and my application was was thrown out, um, and it made you know makes life very uncertain. Um, you don't really know how to like plan your life for the next few months. You don't really know how to you know build your build your career <laughs> when you don't know uh, where which continent you're going to be on soon. So um, that uncertainty and this like internalizing um, and negotiating um, and seeing your own identity as sort of transactional, like, oh, if I behave a certain way, then someone will sponsor me a green card. You know, um, all of these things um, stayed with me for years and eventually made their way into the novel along with um, many other things, including um, just sort of seeing someone you love dearly change or realizing you are that someone changing. Like when I talk to my family um, who are now um, halfway across the world from me, I can sort of see them, see me changing. And it's a, you know, often a very uncomfortable feeling. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There are many um, layers of alienation in your novel. Um, and it began back when the characters are even in Malaysia, where they're sort of estranged from those places in themselves and when they're in America it's like another layer of alienation but that also makes I think one of the characters commented about how it makes them just like used to it and it's kind of almost liberating in in a way and sometimes I, I think I, I do feel that way and, and especially um, you know in the American office environment which you go into um, in a, almost a horrifying manner and it's it's very to me it's very recognizable. Um, I I work in in the uh, 
digital advertising space sometimes and there's always these h1b super asian designers who hang out and i don't know how long they <laughs> they stay up working till but then when there's a presentation the next day it's always like the bro who who gives the yeah. presentation and gets the applause um do, do you pull in a lot from yeah, i know it's like always an iffy about pulling in experiences and things from places where you actually still operate in um mm -hmm. did you encounter some difficulties with that um encounter difficulties with pulling in threads from from the spaces i move in in america you mean yeah. from from like um from your working life mm -hmm. yeah. is um and yeah. these are things that maybe you have witness or seen mm -hmm. whether through yourself or through some other gotcha. people gotcha. yeah yeah um and i know there you know there's like plenty of reports out there in recent years um like susan susan fowler at uber um the recent blizzard reports um so you know like there i feel like there's like no shortage of sensational news coverage to the extent that i don't really need to pull from uh, anything really that happened mm -hmm. uh, to me, but I think um, for sure there are like you know there are good companies and there are bad companies. Um, but I think what what the novel tries to focus on is like when you are an H one B immigrant, uh, you sort of feel like you know I, again going back to like you feel your identity as transactional. Um, mm -hmm. which is a very odd thing. I know like people, maybe a lot of people now are used to think of, of themselves as brands, but that's still a little bit different. Like, you know, if you try to manage your personality as a brand, you you sort of have more say on what you want it to be. Uh, whereas as an H-1B worker, um, you sort of are subject, like you, you want to present yourself the way you think your manager wants you to be or the office environment wants you to be. And that can lead to, yeah, you know, uh, suppressing a lot of um, unfair treatment or inappropriate treatment. And yeah, absolutely. Um, some of that feeling, you know, is, is personal. Um, I have encountered in previous uh, work spaces that I moved through in America, um, just sort of like, if you face harassment, you feel like, you're more reluctant to raise it because you know in a month you want to ask your manager for something <laughs> mm -hmm. so you have to be like the perfect worker or you have to be the way um yeah they wish you to be yeah yeah so it's like and a something, scenario yeah and something that you mentioned that um was also recognizable to me is also you know as an immigrant to this country you confront this thing called humor <sighs> that is supposedly this cultural binding glue for all these other people <laughs> and um your characters also face this fence this giant fence of humor as well can you also go into that yeah i think yeah um a stereotype i believe or i encountered um as an asian american worker uh is or an asian immigrant worker is yeah asian immigrants are robotic, humorless, you know, they're workhorses, but, you know, they don't know how to talk to people or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that has been very interesting to me um, because when, when I think about it, like the, if you, as a skilled, you know, so-called skilled worker, the way to get a visa is to work as, you know, an iBanker or a software engineer, like no one's gonna really sponsor you a green card for, being a poet or a stand-up comedian. So in a way that, you know, there's like some self-selection um, there already, like they're rewarding you with green cards for being a certain type. And then they come hit you with, oh, but you're, you're typecast this way. Like, you know, that's just your, mm -hmm. your mold. That's your, yeah. you're, you're in the circle. And so um, I think, yeah, in the novel, Edwina, the main character, um, she, understands exactly what you said which is like humor is like this price personality trait or quality in america um it's you know like she and she sort of covets it and she, she really wants um to fit in um outside of what her workplace expects her to be so it's almost like her quiet little way of rebelling um, against the stereotypes that 
the workplace has put on her, you know, oh, you're supposed to be robotic humorless. So she's like, no, I'm going to be, you know, really funny. And she sometimes she is funny. Sometimes she sort of falls on her face a little bit, but that's her, her process of like figuring it out, her little quiet rebellion yeah. that maybe no one else cares about, but it's super important to her like emotional well-being. Yeah. And she's dealing with a lot because you're, um, we're talking about all these issues with H1B um, and alienation. And she also has this problem that her husband has disappeared. So she's going through all these things that are tied to her being able to stay in this place. Right. Um, and she's also lost someone. Mm -hmm. um, now, the way that you told the story, um, there's this interesting alternation that happens in the beginning and the, the structure then kind of just like follows her story. Did, did you come to the story in this way? Did you see it um, as you wrote it or did you have like a, like almost like a scheme of some sort um, mm -hmm. when you first began the novel? Um, you no, know, so this, um, this structure came about after many drafts, um, conversations with early readers, with my agent, my editor, um, they all had really excellent suggestions for the best ways um, to go about it. But I think even in the very first draft, um, the structure was sort of latent, it was um, sort of there under the surface, um, because from the very first draft, past life stories uh, were a key part of the narrative. Um, and the, you know, the, the idea that past life stories inform mm -hmm. your present behavior, um, I think that sort of lends itself to the, okay, we have to look back and look, look now, look back and look now. I'm sort of try, like try to, um, there's just like this human yearning to ascribe everything that happened to us to something in the past where there's like a narrative, like, like a linkage, uh, some, some sense. Um, so I think that structure um, that, later emerged um, works very well for Wina's story um, and the structure yeah. for, yeah, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> yeah, I know, I, I, I was, I was um, it, it reminded me at first of the way I had read um, the Ling Ma book, Severance, where there's that kind of alternation and rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, so I was almost expecting that kind of arrival to uh, of a future that then proceeds but then it kind of breaks away in a very interesting way um, that really focuses on Edwina and, and the way that she is dealing with her present and you know, with a lot of things that are, are often skipped over in, in, in our Asian society, like mental health. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also where there's, and you also have this interesting mix of the technological and the supernatural um, were, were those themes that you wanted to bring together? Yeah, definitely. Um, I, th those like themes that seem so different, I wanted to um, bring them together um, because for me, it's a way of showing how Edwina, again, is like trying on different identities. Um, mm -hmm. So, so she, the like tech, techno technology uh, personality, the tech speak, the like, almost name dropping sometimes. Um, it, it starts out as like her way of relating to her husband, who is um, the more technical in their marriage. He, um, you know, is a software engineer. That's his bread and but butter uh, or, or was. And um, she, she so, so that's one factor. And the other is obviously a tech career will help her get a, a green, increase her chances of getting a green card. Um, so that's two, so she's sort of like, wears this like tech identity as a cloak um and she's like desperately clinging on to it um when marlin her husband um i guess a, a sort of abandons her uh, because she sees it as her way of relating to him mm -hmm. and she doesn't want to think about the fact that when if they split up then their her chance at getting a green card is basically halved because if they were still together um one of them only one of them needs to get a green card and the other person sort of automatically benefits. But now if, if they're split, then that's no longer the case. And um, she doesn't want to think about her marriage in that transactional way. 
word mm-hmm. keeps coming back. So, so she's just trying to like cloak her thoughts um, yeah. into that. Yeah, I'm a type person too. Um, yeah. And yeah, yeah. And every I, I think there's a joke about how everybody in Southeast Asia is, is superstitious. Um, <laughs> and yeah, that that may be true. Like, it's definitely a big part of Edwina's upbringing. Um, mm-hmm. A big part of what uh, her relationship with her mother um, sort of is is built upon uh, her mother relates to her in um, like a folk folk supernatural way um, and and we're not sort of figuring out her relationship to that like she doesn't really want um, that that framing um, but she also mm-hmm. she somewhat leans on it a little bit when she's adrift yeah, yeah she's um she's definitely trying on different identities. She definitely goes through behavioral changes that actually reminded me of almost like um, the reverse of Han Kang's The Vegetarian. Mm. Whereas in that, in that novel, um, you have someone who, is, who feels alienated and thus adopts this, this vegetarian identity to feel um, distinguished from her peers. But you have this, you have this person right. in your novel who who kind of wants to embrace this America and tries to adopt this this new eating habit, so to say, to, to fit in with this um, this American consumerism. Um, so like there are definitely there's some very interesting character arcs that happen, uh, which makes me think of um, like your the constellation of characters that revolve around um, at, around Edwina and Marlin. Do how did these characters come to you? Did, did you see them? Where um, the, how do they work in furthering your your story? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm trying to think back to, through the many many drafts the story has gone through. Um, I know for sure that I um, pretty somewhat early on um, I wanted an Asian American character. Um, to sort of be like the contrast to Edwina, who is um, Asian, newly or as- aspiring Asian American, if you will. Um, and so her friend Katie um, was born and raised in America, sort of like her her guide a little bit. And um, they, Katie and Edwina, find each other ridiculous as at certain points, but also find each other like completely mm-hmm. illuminating and fascinating at other times. Um, so yeah, that's that's um, a relationship I wanted to explore as someone who um, doesn't necessarily quote unquote know how to be Asian American <laughs> all the time or just yet. Um, and yeah, I just like a side sidetrack a little bit um, after a reading for one of my, uh, sorry, after a reading for my book, um, someone came up to me, like a very young person came up to me um, and asked, like, how do you reconcile feeling between, torn between two cultures, um, the American culture and your culture? Um, and this happened multiple times. The first time it happened, I was quite taken aback, actually, because I, I don't feel torn between two cultures. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I just sort of firmly feel that, you know, I'm Malaysian. Um, Mm -hmm. and in Malaysia, I might feel torn, but in America, like, I don't, I don't feel that, you know, that gap. Um, I, I try to give, give, like, as useful an an answer as I could to the person, um, (laughs) of course, but yeah, it, it really, um, sort of drove home for me that there is a difference between, um, how I experience, you know, being an Asian American, how someone born here experiences, um, that identity. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that was something I wanted to reflect in the book, um, and yeah, the side, uh, other side characters such as um, Edwina's mother, I think is very important. Uh, she's uh, always been an important part of the story, um, just to set up um, the scenario where Edwina, you know, has a choice um, for immigration, like many many people might not, but she, she does. And so there's like a lot of space for self-doubt and regret. Like, you know, am I making the right choice? Should I just go back to, you know, where everything, at least the discrimination is familiar. <laughs> I don't have to learn, you know, new racist language or something. Um, but there's this push and pull 
you know, of her and her mother that sort of makes it complicates the decision mm -hmm. for her. Yeah. Yeah, there's that definitely the tension that um, exists between like, you know, where she is and where she was. Um, and like the big question is like, what's going to happen to her now? And these characters are, are really like pulling her in different directions. I mean, I, I saw um, the character of Katie. What was interesting to me was the character of Katie and the character of Eamon, who are like Asian American, Asian Americans. They were almost like, like these magical natives in a way. <laughs> but instead of it, it just being some sort of exoticized country, it's like America. And they kind of like help this out of their good hearts, like help this um, this person navigate um, through a very, very confusing culture. That is also a very scary culture as well, as we see in a few episodes that happens with the, the with both the characters um, in which it really brings out the I mean, I certainly have have felt this, like, especially post 2016 you know, like going up, getting on a bus to New Hampshire and feeling like I have to have my papers on me because ice right. could pull over the bus at any time. Mm -hmm. And there's like definitely full, fully intense and dark episodes that happen almost at the flick of a switch mm -hmm. to your characters. Can you speak more to that? Yeah, um, I think there are several sort of scary nerve-wracking episodes um, for our Malaysian immigrant characters. One is the detention at the JFK. Um, so, you know, they're sort of more pre-2016, they're more used to breezing through security, um, encountering more friendly faces in the form of immigration officers. Um, but then, you know, something happens. Um, like post-2016, they're going through airport security, but this time, you know, they're pulled aside, they're detained for no good reason, really, just um, there are no reasons ever given to them, and they don't really expect a reason. Like, Edwina's uh, husband, Marlin, um, is half Indian, and um, he has dark skin, darker skin than Edwina, so um, that is like the best, their, their best hypothesis, like that is why. And the sad thing is, you know, that they even come to this conclusion and they don't like think twice about it, um, they're just in survival mode. Like, what do, what do we do? They, they, there's like no avenue for questioning or fighting back, really. Um, that's one. And the other is, like you said, you know, you, you feel this like paranoid need to always have your papers on you. Um, so Elena, uh carelessly, because her state of mind is sort of jumbled, she doesn't. Um, and she sort of stopped on the streets by a couple of cops. Um, and it's, you know, completely terrifying for her, but for the police, um, it's sort of a lighthearted situation. They like yeah. crack some jokes at her expense. Like again, you know, the humor, humor thing comes in um, and they don't, like they sort of toss a wisecrack at her, uh, like a racist joke at her and walk away. Um, they don't like expect her to understand or involve her in their joke. It's like just this joke for them whereas it's a completely terrifying episode for her. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so these are, in, yeah, of, of, of course, many, many worse things and encounters happen um, to people. But, you know, I, I think those encounters um, are sort of soul shaking for Edwina as, as a character in her situation, like worried about her green card. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as, as it was for Marlon as well in this episode. And then there is something that really is highlighted in, in your novel where um, you know, this place of, that sets forth this image of reputed freedom, America, the beacon of, of democracy and equality in this world um, is becomes a, a very different experience for, for people who are, um, you know, here for reasons of, of exploitation in, in, in many different ways. And, and there is a very critical image of, of, of that culture, that consumerism, the, comp the competition um, that goes on where, where, I, where it does feel like people are, are in this, like as happy 
seeming Americans might be, there's just like inner competition factor that happens. And there's this um, climbing gym scene in which she sort of sees this. She, mm -hmm. um, and, and do you find yourself um, like feeling this in some personal way that um, came through in the book about, about almost like seeing, experiencing a, a different America perhaps than what you might have been sold? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think I sort of stumbled into America. Um, so I, I don't really had a pre, I didn't really have a preconception of what was being sold um, to me, but for sure, like the reputation, right? Um, this, your question actually brought me to um, uh, an, a personal experience. Uh, I had a friend, an American friend, visit me in Malaysia uh, once, um, and I was I was really mortified by this. Uh, but some of my relatives actually started, um, you know, almost verbally attacking this friend for for America's uh, faults and wars, like imperialism, um, and and. And all of that, so um, I think the awareness that America is not this, you know, shiny city on the hill um, has has long been building up overseas. I think mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, young people now especially, um, are um, aware that the the myth making um, only mm -hmm. goes so far. Like there's a lot of yeah, a lot of realities, um, especially with social media, um, that people are quick to pick up on and um, quick to understand. Um, so I think that also feeds in more and more to Edwina as a character's um, internal struggle. Like, well, America's not that great, um, my, you know, uh, and maybe I shouldn't be here if if America mm -hmm. isn't, um, yeah, isn't isn't as like all it's cracked out to be and she sort of leans on um, her Asian American friends a little bit uh, for for guidance almost um, and she there's a scene where she asks her friend Katie have you ever thought about leaving America if you have so much you know so many complaints about it as an Asian American um, and sort of to her surprise Katie says no never um, and she thinks well that's the difference between a mm -hmm. real Asian American and me and you know an aspiring Asian American yeah. yeah was there um speaking of of these differences um transcontinentally and I think the last book that you had was a short story collection that's largely set in in Malaysia right um and you have this book now that's set in America was there um was it difficult to shift mm -hmm. between writing these two different places um that's a really great question. I think actually it might be a little bit the opposite where I increasingly felt maybe less comfortable writing about Malaysia because I've been away for a while. Um, you know, my my uh, first book um, touches on, yeah, like the politics of the country, um, like the social persecution of um, like minorities um, and LGBTQ people. Um, and those are issues that I obviously care deeply about, um, but increasingly I feel that maybe, you know, I no longer, my, I don't have my finger on the pulse as much anymore. Um, but I, of course I'm not, I'm not saying I won't ever write, um, about Malaysia, but, um, I wanted to explore, um, like a lot of complicated feelings, um, yeah, about moving away from, from there and not quite arriving in the next place yet. So this like limbo state. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then there's still, um, there's still these stories within the stories that sort of like set in, in Malaysia um, that's within here as well. So it, it's very interwoven. Um, and, and along with them are also these, these factoids um, like um, about the foreign accent syndrome or, or animal documentary scenes did you collect these fact, almost like uh, interesting stories with the purpose of writing it into a book or was it something that you came from research for this book mm -hmm. um 
it's I would say it's it's more things that I I had pondered like what what do like how do um super, how does superstition like inform person's identity and what happens when it not only informs your identity but you actually use it to relate to other people um and um how like if someone doesn't agree to be like part of that framing then how does that that work um so the banana tree spirit um is and um I, I, yeah one of my early readers Moi uh, she's um she's thai she actually said yeah there there's like a similar story a, a yeah, it's a nang yeah. Sani in um, in thai yeah there you go yeah so it's like sort of a southeast asian uh thing um so i mean i was absolutely grew up surrounded um by stories like that you know like wayward women or like scary women's like female spirits um so that's something she grew up when <laughs> hi um oh, yeah. yeah yeah so how does that inform her uh especially when um she sort of trust by like you know uh, these stories are sort of imposed on her how does she attempt to fight back um in her case she actually um doesn't she tries to relate uh, in the end tries to relate to her mother and like actually tries to borrow strength from these superstitious stories uh, where she like draws courage from um yeah a character in this past life story um so yeah i've i've always been interested in yeah how obviously um society societal beliefs shape um and we not believe and also how paperwork like green card you know uh paperwork green card forms shape her identity and how do these sort of bump up against each other yeah yeah, and, and these are decisions that are like, it feels so consequential just ticking these forms, right? That just, yeah. um, that are just like so weird. And I think yeah. the, the, your character does, um, and, and it does this in a way that hopefully makes it, makes that strangeness um, very palpable for, for people who might not have had to deal with this. So it's like, um, so I thought that was a, a very astute um, way of bringing um, these hurdles and, and illustrating them um, for for folks. Um, Thank you. Trying to do are we up onto question time or are we? Uh, I think I think we can do. I think I see one question. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. Someone is writing from Jakarta. Um, she, um, this person is uh, my Malaysian, Chinese, American, Hokkien, Cantonese wife of 43 years. It's a survival of um, the 13th of May, 69 riots. Um, and they've been in the US for 25 years. And she generally follows the way of her generation which is to eat bitterness um, in contrast to younger Asian Americans who are less likely to take this approach. Um, your comments on this? <laughs> well, I, I think it's, it really boils down to your sense of security, right? Um, when you say younger Asian American, I assume you mean, you know, people who were born and raised here, you know, you're a citizen, like you don't really have or you don't feel like you have much to worry or be scared about. Um, but if you come in as an adult or if your status, citizenship status is uncertain or conditional on certain things um, as said earlier, then yeah, I, I think there might be less room for you to, um, yeah, it, there might be less room for you to not eat bitterness. <laughs> um, mm. it, you might see it as like part of the part of the outcome of your a decision of yours to like move across the ocean say like, well you know I took that step so this is a natural outcome I need to follow it see it through to the end. Um, yeah I think I think that's basically it but also perhaps like maybe now as we said talked about earlier more and more people are maybe more skeptical of um, America's sort of um, mythology. So it's 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 possible too that more and more people are starting to see um, you know 
there there are other ways to live and be and exist and um yeah to stand up against those yeah i was i was thinking of like the the reverse of eat bitterness i'm like is that like to vomit sweetness <laughs> um which i guess is what people do more now these days um with all the the twitter love that we you see every day um any other questions for yz please put into the um q a box any questions chats are also good for questions too let me see if i have um some other questions from my list while people have a, a gander uh what about josh <laughs> oh. um this character is so ridiculous but also recognizable as well and 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 um that novel that he writes um <laughs> did you enjoy writing did you enjoy it's a weird thing you did you enjoy writing josh as a character because he's he seems simple at first but then there are things that he does later that reveals that there's other aspects of him as well um yeah i like to think he's not a one-dimensional villain <laughs> um <laughs> yeah his novel was really fun to write uh for sure just like trying to imagine myself in this space you know where you think oh i'm great everything i write is absolutely amazing <laughs> uh, yeah short-lived but really fun um but yeah josh um yeah de definitely he he thinks of himself as having depth thinks of himself as um you know not a tech bro so um is interesting for me and maybe you know sometimes um brings back unhappy memories to write about them um like like you say you know it's a sort of a familiar character um i'm sure you know quite a lot of us have encountered people who believe that they're good and sensitive um when actually they're quite clueless about the ways that they're um yeah harming or invading other space yeah, so fun <laughs> And a, a related question um, is from Jeannie Venasco. What's your approach to writing minor characters with depth? Um, she's thinking of what Lauren Euler writes in the NYTBR, chin specificity and wonderfully drawn minor characters add depth and richness to a story that another writer might have washed out with um, glaring light of moral clarity and applause. At that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jeannie. Um, Jeannie is a wonderful writer of two memoirs, including The Glass Eye. Everyone should check it out. Absolutely amazing. Um, my minor characters, uh, I, I think they were, they became a necessity. Uh, I think to this book, I realized because um, we're so heavy in Edwina's, you know, internal thoughts, monologues, um, suffering. <laughs> um, and it, it can get a bit much. Um, and there was also feedback I heard from uh, readers, agent editors. Um, so it, I think it's crucial to have um, interesting um, minor characters and my approach to writing them, um, I think it's just to think about uh, what are some types of personalities or ways of communication that would um, allow Edwina to um, quote unquote shine or like sort of make apparent that her behavior is erratic. Um, so sort of um, complementary uh, personality traits, almost. Um, yeah, and, and sort of, you know, how, how can they help move uh, the plot forward? Uh, so, for example, Eamon is uh, also a software engineer, and she sort of needs him in the end um, to help her find Marlin, and um, his job is sort of crucial to that. Yeah. Did you read a lot of detective like stories uh i i do love detective fiction um i i i don't know if i could ever write like a traditional one but i i do love reading detective fiction i think a lot of people do just because you know our lives are so full of uncertainty and 
you sort of want want a, a plot where you know someone's going to figure things out. Someone has the answers, mm -hmm. um, maybe. But also, um, a lot of times the mysteries aren't for me aren't who who did it, but more like why. You know, why would yeah. what would move somebody to do these extreme extreme acts? So, human mm. behavior um, very interesting for me in detective fiction.